going to transition from initially setting the ventilator, getting those right settings that Dr. Allison just taught us on, now to what do we do with the patient when they're lying there. We've got them situated on the ventilator, but how do we adequately sedate and provide appropriate analgesia to those patients? And to lead us in that discussion, some critical pearls and pitfalls, we have Dr. Ashley Martinelli. Dr. Martinelli is currently a clinical assistant professor in the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. She earned her doctorate of pharmacy from the University of Cincinnati, did her first year residency at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and then a critical care pharmacy residency at Allegheny General Hospital. And somewhere around 2017, we were able to thankfully recruit her here to the University of Maryland, where she has been an amazing resource, a critical member of our ED team, a stellar superstar ED pharmacist that I like to engage probably in almost every patient care interaction that I have. As many of you know, I tend to have a black cloud and many critically ill patients coming in. And Ashley is an amazing and wonderful resource and really does a lot to improve patient care. So with that, Dr. Martinelli, give us some pearls and pitfalls on post-intubation analgesia and sedation. All right, thank you guys so much and for having me, and thank you, Dr. Winters, for that wonderful introduction. Before we get started today, I just have one disclosure. My husband is a scientist for AstraZeneca, so I am married to my conflict of interest, um, and I have to disclose that before I give any presentation. As far as objectives, we're going to look at the most recent guideline recommendations, as well as primary literature for both post-intubation, pain, agitation, and sedation management. We're going to look at the different agents that you have in your toolbox and develop an optimal treatment plan. And then we're going to think about some different patient populations. And I'll be asking you to use Poll Everywhere, so when those slides come up, um, please engage. We have a lot of cases at the end to go through. When should you start thinking about your post-intubation sedation plan? You should really start thinking about that as you're developing your RSI plan and thinking about which medications you're going to use to intubate the patient and do that all at the same time. Why that's particularly important is that there's a duration mismatch. I've listed here for you the most common induction agents that we're using in our emergency department, and this is standard across most institutions. You can see the onset, uh, or the duration of action, excuse me, is about 10 minutes for these agents, maybe up to 15. But when you look at the duration of action for the paralytic therapy, it's significantly longer if you're using a medication like rocuronium or vecuronium, where it can last up to 60 minutes. So you may have a patient who's sedated, or not sedated, but is paralyzed. And we really want to avoid that situation and avoid having someone be potentially awake, but unable to move and be paralyzed. What's also important to think about when you're considering this plan is what's readily available and accessible in your department. Why this matters is a lot of the agents that we're going to talk about are con controlled substances, which if they're not already in your department may require preparation and delivery from the pharmacy, which can delay. And then also you want to have these things ready to go right after rapid sequence intubation is completed. That way you can again bridge that gap between the end of your um, sedative agent wearing off and potentially that patient still being paralyzed. I want to make a special note here to think about what your nurses are familiar with. If they're already familiar with the medication, it's potentially in your automated dispensing cabinet within your department. They're going to be able to get that up and running on a pump, have it in the room, potentially before you even intubate, and that way it's a seamless transition from your RSI medications directly to your continuous sedation. I would also have you think about, if you're routinely having to ask for things that aren't in the department, to talk to your pharmacy staff, whether you have one in the unit like we have here at University of Maryland, or your pharmacy colleagues in general at your institution, and optimize that medication storage so that way when you do need something, it's there if it's reasonable to stock in that machine. <laughs> 
The final piece that's really crucial to all of this is while you can think of this great plan, it's really important to communicate this plan with all team members. We have this intubation checklist, which is on the outside of all of our rooms. And when you, the nurses or physicians use this QR code, it actually brings up our RSI checklist electronically. We've done this on paper for years, and it's also been a helpful tool, so you don't have to be as tech savvy as this. This was something we implemented during COVID to just eliminate paper and people moving things in and out of the room. But a part of our checklist is actually going through the medications that you're going to use, both for intubation and also for post-intubation sedation. So this is something to consider. That way, again, those medications are on a pump, they're primed, they're ready to go as soon as you want to get started. Why is this so important? Now, critical illness, we know, can cause a lot of stress and discomfort, and these are some staggering statistics. 82% of patients in one study noted that they had discomfort with just the breathing tube itself. 77% just remember having moderate to severe pain during their critical illness. And some people rate that pain as one of the most traumatic components of their stay. So while we want to make sure that people are comfortable and potentially sedated, we're always walking this really fine line between undertreatment and overtreatment. Because both of undertreatment and overtreatment are associated with increased risk of PTSD. If you undertreat someone, they potentially have increased levels of anxiety. They may also have a higher energy expenditure. And that alone can lead to that post-traumatic stress disorder development. We also know on the flip side, going too heavy, too deep, having someone who's not arousable, that leads to longer durations of mechanical ventilation and also can increase the risk of PTSD from them not being able to participate in their care, not really fully understand what's going on, and not be able to fit those pieces together when they're recovering to really understand what happened. And that can lead to a lot of anxiety in our patients. So again, remember that you're always walking this fine balance. There's some great guidelines to help us overall figure out what these plans should look like. Um, the SCCM guidelines for pain agitation, sedation, delirium, immobility, and sleep disruption are what are the gold standard for managing our mechanically ventilated patients. Our goals with using these guidelines and in trying to develop these plans is to have a patient that's awake or slightly drowsy, that's okay too, um, that's comfortable, not in acute distress, not in acute pain, and able to participate in their care. When we think about the emergency department and what role we're going to play in this, we're initially going to start off with that pain and agitation or sedation management to try to get them to that awake, slightly drowsy, comfortable level. Let's first start talking about pain and how we're going to appropriately manage pain in our patients. Post-intubation can be fraught with a lot of acute pain. These patients are critically ill, and if they're getting intubated, they probably also have a lot of other potential procedures that need to be done in order to facilitate their care. So we know intubation alone could be painful. We're also potentially holding their arm out to the side flat to do an A-line. We may be putting femoral lines in, lines in their neck, um, positioning them in a way that is potentially just uncomfortable. Have you ever laid on an ED stretcher for a prolonged period of time? They're awful. Um, they're pretty terrible mattresses, and so our patients, especially our elderly patients or those with any kind of um, underlying conditions, just that bed alone may be uncomfortable for them. We're also hoisting them into the CT scanner. We're lifting them up and shoving our x-ray boards underneath them and potentially putting catheters in either their nose or Foley catheters. So we're doing a lot of things in that acute phase that could potentially induce pain. On top of this, patients have chronic pain that we also aren't addressing. Um, they may have the low back pain. Again, the mattresses, nose positioning could be problematic. And they all also may be on some home medications, either non-opioid or opioid-like medications, that we need to make sure we're thinking about when we're developing plans for our patients. Opioids are really going to be our first line agents to manage a patient's acute pain. They offer both analgesia and they can be slightly sedating. So you're kind of getting a, a nice bundle here to get a nice comfortable patient by giving an opioid medication. How we're gonna do this is we're going to bolus these drugs. We're gonna give a bolus up front if they need a rate because they're either fail, failing multiple boluses, um, that's okay. And those are typically titrated for a pain score for patients awake or by a provider if we have to set a rate. I've listed here the most common opioids that we're going to use for this indication. So fentanyl being our workhorse here, followed by morphine and hydromorphone. 
The onset for all of them is very quick. That's again with IV push onset, so very fast. And the duration varies depending on which drug you're using, with fentanyl being the shortest. I've listed some common bolus dosing. So fentanyl, we're used to giving anywhere from 25 to 100 micrograms of fentanyl. And typically, when we think of those bolus doses, about one per kilo or slightly less is probably an okay starting dose. I've also listed the continuous infusions here. Now, something that I see commonly done is let's just start them on a fentanyl drip. If you start someone on a fentanyl drip and you say start it at 25 micrograms per hour, that's essentially equivalent to having a nurse stand there and slowly push 25 micrograms over an hour. If that was me, 25 micrograms, number one, may not actually treat my acute pain, but if you stood there and slowly administered that 25 mics over an hour, I'd probably be pretty mad that you aren't actually addressing my pain. So what's important to do is not just to slowly increase your rate on your fentanyl infusions if you're using it for pain, but to actually give a bolus dose. The bolus is to treat that acute pain, that procedural related pain, um, any kind of you know, sedation needs that you need if you think an opioid might be helpful because they're on chronic pain medications and maybe we're not treating it appropriately. But giving a bolus dose up front is very important. Think of that as your acute management, and then that drip is just maintaining some background dose. If you're doing additional procedures, additional positioning, then it's again reasonable to give an additional bolus dose. So please don't underdose your patients if you think that they have a need for an opioid, administer a bolus up front. Some additional things to think about, here in Baltimore at least, we have a very high percentage of our patients that have substance use disorders. They may need additionally high doses of the opioids or maybe repetitive boluses to get their pain under control before putting them on a maintenance rate. I've also listed some adjunctive therapy here to think about, whether that's acetaminophen, lidocaine patches, or ketamine. Um, we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about ketamine here as it's really not a first line medication. Um, we can talk about it in the Q&A if you have some more questions. Moving next, let's talk about our sedatives and what options we have. This is the Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale. We've been using this scale for years to try to best assess what level of sedation our patients have and ultimately where we want them to be. Now, I've seen this scale done several times incorrectly. How you actually administer this scale is you walk into the room and if you're assessing the top numbers, the positive numbers, you can easily just look at the patient and determine if they are anywhere from restless to violent, dangerous, um, you know, aggressive towards staff. That scale is really easy to visually look at. Where I think we struggle is actually assessing the lower half of the scale or the sedation scale. Our goal here is a zero to negative two. You've probably put that on every order you've ever written for sedation but it's important to know how you actually get this number. This would mean that you walk into the patient's room, you say their name very loudly, and they do something to the voice. If they're a negative one, that means they're opening their eyes, they're making eye contact with you for great, at least 10 seconds. If they're a negative two, they're making eye contact, but it's less than 10 seconds. Once you get below that, you're at negative three, where maybe they're just arousing a little bit to that voice, but they're not actually making eye contact with you. If you have to walk over and sternal rub, push on their nail beds, do any kind of stimulation to try to wake them up, you're already at a negative four. And if they do nothing to any of your physical stimulation, they're negative five. So too often I feel like we have people at negative four, negative five, and we may not be charting them appropriately. So think about that and make sure that you're actually doing some assessments of your patients to see where they are. Our first line options when we move out of the opioids and the analgesia into more of our sedation medications are propofol and dexmedetomidine. Looking at the two in a comparison, our propofol is a GABA agonist predominantly. It has some other mechanism of actions that aren't fully understood, but we primarily think of it as a GABA agonist, whereas dexmedetomidine is an alpha-2 agonist. The other alpha-2 agonist on the market that we use for other indications is clonidine. I like to remind people of that because it's the similar adverse events um, and just clinical effects of the medication prevail. They both have a really quick onset, so that's great for both of them. Looking at adverse events, they both cause cardiac side effects, mainly hypotension. 
the dexmedetomidine can also cause bradycardia. With propofol, we also think about the elevated triglyceride level because it is a lipid emulsion and rarely propofol-related infusion syndrome, which typically comes with higher doses or prolonged use. But again, when you're immediately treating the patient, you're thinking more about assessing their hemodynamics and picking a drug that best fits that profile. This is a key. In all of the studies that have looked at propofol and dexmedetomidine, the target RAS that you can actually achieve with dexmedetomidine is a RAS of zero to negative two. So again, that's going in, waking them up to voice. With propofol, you have a little bit more of a range. So if you have someone that you're starting and you've just intubated them and you think potentially they need aggressive procedures, you may need to do some aggressive vent maneuvers, um, you may need to consider paralyzing them, propofol gives you a more range to be able to either keep them very lightly sedated or to get them down to that negative five should you need to. You really can't get there with dexmedetomidine. It's just not designed to do that from that alpha two agonist um, activity profile. Dosing is listed here just for your reference. And the cost of dexmedetomidine has come down in the most recent years. It's still a little bit more than propofol, but um, not as big of a concern as it used to be. You'll notice that I did not put benzodiazepine infusions as first line in that table. We really shouldn't be using benzodiazepine infusions as our first line in any scenario um, outside of a few things we'll talk about afterwards. But this should not be your go-to. If this is still your go-to in practice, I would challenge you to start considering whether the other two medications could be incorporated into your practice. Benzodiazepine infusions, especially prolonged benzodiazepine infusions, can cause um, increased rates of delirium, and we know that that just leads to longer durations of stay and longer durations of mechanical ventilation. So again, trying to avoid benzodiazepines. I will say that there are a few instances where this would be appropriate. If you have someone who's seizing in status epilepticus, we know benzos are our first line here. It's perfectly acceptable to start them on a benzo infusion. If someone's in extreme alcohol withdrawal and getting intubated to manage their DTs, also not an inappropriate indication. There could potentially be a toxicology indication for it. And then we've actually used it a little bit more in our COVID patients, just because we've had to have them sedated for so much longer um, and potentially doing things like proning them, ECMO, doing some things that we just can't continue them on propofol indefinitely. And we need to have them at a deeper level of sedation. That being said, one of my favorite tricks is to have in my back pocket, a, not literally because it's a controlled substance, but in my mind, um, to have a stat dose of lorazepam available in that acute management phase. If you have someone who you're starting all of your drips, things just aren't working, they're very agitated, things aren't going well, you need to get them compliant with the vent, a single dose of lorazepam in addition to what you've already started with your propofol and potentially your opioid therapy could be enough to really calm that patient down, allow you to get an hour or two of calm where you can really control that environment and control that patient's safety. So consider that as a one-time dose. That's, again, not an infusion, but something that you can use if you get into a dangerous situation. Going back to propofol versus dexmedetomidine, and which one should you use? Um, our first trial with dexmedetomidine showed that it had a lower incidence of coma compared to a lorazepam infusion. What I've already talked about pretty much says that that's, we know that, right? Um, dexmedetomidine doesn't get you to those deep levels of sedation, whereas lorazepam patients tend to get over-sedated. Um, when you look at the SEDCOM trial, um, this compared dexmedetomidine to midazolam infusions and also found an, a decreased rate of delirium and a reduction in their time to extubation. So dexmedetomidine outperformed midazolam. Then there was the Midex Prodex trial. This looked at dexmedetomidine versus midazolam and propofol for maintenance of your rascal, and dexmedetomidine was non inferior. So again, taking midazolam out of the equation because we're just not doing benzo infusions anymore. The playing field is pretty level between the two, at least from these early papers. Most recently this year, there was a study in New England Journal of Medicine trying to look at whether there was a difference in dexmedetomidine or propofol for patients who are mechanically ventilated with sepsis. This was in a study that looked at over 400 patients, which is a quite a large number compared to some of the earlier papers. Um, what they found was that the median RAS of these patients was about a negative two, so that's great. Only 60% of the time of the time patients were in their target sedation range, so maybe not so good. And interestingly, when you look at the patients and the amount of sedation they received in this study, their doses were very low. 
Um, so questionable as to the benefit of the sedation um, choice. What they found overall is not surprising, was that the days alive free of coma or delirium was no different, no difference in ventilator free days, and also no difference in death at 90 days. So this really kind of solidified that you can use either propofol or dexmedetomidine as your first line sedation agent. However, please think about your desired level of sedation. Know that hypotension and potentially bradycardia with the dexmedetomidine as well can occur, and this can happen with both, and think about what's in the unit what are your nurses most familiar with? What can you get started quickly so that you avoid that mismatch in someone being paralyzed from the RSI and not adequately sedated? We're gonna flip now and do some patient cases. So I hope that the poll everywhere is working. Um, get your phones out. Um, so hopefully we can have some fun with this. Case number one, you have a 64 year old female who has a history of hypotension, or sorry, has a history of COPD, excuse me, hypertension and diabetes. She presented with acute hypoxia required intubation. She was given 20 milligrams of atomidate and 80 milligrams of rocuronium. I've listed the post-intubation vitals there for you. Um, you have a blood pressure that's great, 122 over 95, little tachycardic, standing well on FI FIO2 of 40%, and respiratory rate currently is 16. Patient has no known drug allergies and is an average height and weight. What is your initial post-intubation sedation and analgesia plan for this patient? If you can text um, UMEM to 37607 to join that way, or you can use the Poll Everywhere app. I'm not seeing any responses. All right, so we're gonna just talk about some of these options and what is the best one while they try to figure out if the poll everywhere is going to start working for us. So the first option is a propofol infusion followed by a midazolam bolus and infusion, a propofol infusion and a fentanyl bolus, a dexmedetomidine infusion with a fentanyl bolus, or a fentanyl infusion followed by a midazolam infusion. Now hopefully I've hammered it in enough that we aren't using midazolam as our first line agents that takes off the first and the last option. And then really it's based on your practice and your comfortability, whether you want to do propofol or dexmedetomidine. As this patient is stable, they're not bradycardic, um, their blood pressure isn't, uh, is you know, perfectly acceptable to start either one of those and move on. So here you could really use either one. In our institution, we keep propofol in our automated dispensing cabinets and have that available. So that's what we would typically use here. Thinking about this plan even more, you wanna make sure that you're bolusing your opioids, that you re-bolus the analgesia if needed, or you start an infusion. So your fentanyl infusion should really come after you've given a few bolus doses um, and find that they need more than just those intermittent boluses. And then again, if it's a stable patient, you can use either propofol or dexmedetomidine. Case number two, this is a 58 year old man who was found down at home in cardiac arrest. EMS initiated CPR, administered epinephrine times three, the patient was intubated in the field and achieved FROSC. No shocks were administered, and on arrival, their GCS is a 3T. Current vitals are listed here. You have a blood pressure of 100 over 65, a heart rate of 80, an oxygen saturation of 97%, um, and respiratory rate of 14. No known allergies, Height is 70 inches and a weight of 110 kilos. What regimen would you like to begin for this patient? You can either do a propofol infusion with a fentanyl bolus, a dexmedetomidine infusion with a fentanyl bolus, or hold your sedation and analgesia. Looks like it's still not working. So we're gonna move on to thinking about our post ROSC patients. In this instance, I would argue that you start no sedation. Your neurologic exam takes priority at this point in time. You have now a stable patient, you have ROSC, and you wanna make sure that you're assessing whether or not they have any residual neurologic function from an early time point 
The sedatives may be metabolized even more slowly in that post-ROSC phase. And also, patients who have just suffered an anoxic brain injury can be even more sensitive to the effects of your sedation. Where you may start sedation is actually if the patient's moving, if you're worried that they aren't cooperating with the vent, they're not um, ventilating in appropriately, or if they're having to be cooled. So if you're cooling someone, again, you can start that cooling process, but if they start shivering, that's going to increase their overall body temperature and that increase their energy expenditure, which is something we're acutely trying to avoid in that post-ROSC phase. So if you're cooling and the patient is shivering, that would be an indication to start some sedation. And you could start really whatever it makes the most sense for your patient's vitals, whether that's propofol uh, or sex metatomidine. Consider analgesia in those patients who are moving. Again, I would do it more as bolus dosing because you're going to need to frequently pause the sedation in order to reassess their neurologic function in that acute phase. So again, think about light sedation, bolus dose opioids if you need it, and don't automatically put them on drips of everything because it takes a lot longer time for them to hold those drips and then actually see if there's an effect. Case number three, we have a 75-year-old female who was intubated for hypoxia due to pneumonia. She's been stable on the vent for the past three hours, but there's no available ICU beds. I don't know about you, but this is a very common scenario in our department as we typically have to board patients for quite some time. The vitals are listed here, um, relatively stable, blood pressure is looking good, heart rate is 70, oxygen saturations are 99%, on FiO2 40%, respiratory rate is 16. I've listed the current sedation here. We have a propofol drip, it's running at 50 mics per kilo per minute, and fentanyl at 100 mic bolus, followed by 50 mics per hour. When you go in the room, she opens her eyes only to a sternal rub. What is her current RAS? I've only included the lower end because we're obviously in a sedated state. When you think about her current status, if someone is requiring physical touch, remember that's less than point, that's less than negative three, so you're already in negative four, negative five. She is responsive to that physical touch, so you are getting a negative four for her current RAS. Knowing that we're boarding this patient and that it could be a prolonged period of time before they get up to the intensive care unit, we then want to think about how do we manage the over-sedated patient. You're going to assess the RAS yourself. Just like we quickly walked through, it's very easy to do. And then discuss with the nurse. Maybe they just temporarily got there because the patient was pulling at their tube and you need to actually leave them for a few minutes. Or maybe they haven't touched sedation in about an hour or two and it's appropriate to start thinking about pulling that sedation back. It should always be a team discussion with you and the primary nurse taking care of that patient. But you may need to start reducing those doses and have a discussion with what your actual goal of care is for that patient. So in this instance, you have the propofol up at 50 mics per kilo per minute. Our max here is 60. I would start to bring down that propofol a little bit. Again, it's shorter on, shorter off compared to your opioids. And you may be able to see quickly whether or not that's going to make a meaningful impact in your patient. This brings us to our final case. We have a 64-year-old man who is intubated with ketamine and rocuronium for acute hypoxic respiratory failure and sepsis is really high on your differential at this point in time. Following intubation, you've asked the team to start two liters of plasmolite, you've given a fentanyl bolus of 50 micrograms, and you've started propofol relatively low at 10 mics per kilo per minute. Unfortunately, these are your current vitals. You have a blood pressure of 70 over 40 with a MAP of 50, a heart rate of 117, they're acutely febrile, and they have a RAS of positive one. You're also having some issues getting them to be compliant with the vent, and oxygen saturations are at 92%. Their FI2 is, FiO2 is very high at 80%, and again, they're breathing over the vent. You aren't able to get them on the right settings. What would you like to do in this instance? Do you hold sedation? Do you switch propofol to dexmedetomidine because they're hypotensive? Do you start norepinephrine? or do you give a lorazepam bolus? When you're managing the hypotensive patient, remember that you just intubated them and oxygenation and ventilatory compliance is your big priority. In order to make sure that they are getting ad adequate oxygenation, 
you have to manage their hypotension independently of that. So in this instance, you want to think about resuscitating that patient. If they haven't gotten fluids, which this patient already did, you would administer balanced crystalloids. We know balanced crystalloids are ideal in our critically ill patients and are associated with better outcomes. You also need to consider early norepinephrine. Early norepinephrine will allow you to use your sedatives appropriately to get to the right level of sedation that you need in order to get that patient comfortable and able to, again, participate in that ventilation and improve on their vent. So you start norepinephrine. You repeat their vitals. MAP is looking a little bit better. Still a little soft, but better. You're feeling a little bit good. However, even though you started adjusting the vent settings, the patient is still dysynchronous. You have persistent hypoxia. You have a better RAS because you've been able to increase the propofol rate a little bit. But what are you going to do now? Are you again going to change propofol to dexmedetomidine? Are you going to give a bolus of rocuronium? Are you going to start a cisatricurium infusion? Are you going to bolus lorazepam? Or again, increase that propofol rate? I'd argue here that your best two options are either to give a bolus of lorazepam in order to try to get that sedation a little bit better and try to get them more compliant or increase that propofol rate. Again, either one of those, you may have to increase that norepinephrine infusion a little bit more. What you shouldn't do at this point is go straight to your paralytics. Why is that? When you're paralyzing your patients, you want them to be at a RAS of negative 4 to negative 5. That patient was only at a RAS of negative one, which would be inappropriate to give them a, a paralytic at that point in time. So again, sedate your patients before you paralyze them. Increase sedation, increase pressors if you need to, give more fluids if you need to. Again, adequately resuscitate that patient, and that way you can use your medications to your advantage. In this instance, dexmedetomidine is not appropriate. Again, it will not get you to a RAS less than negative two. And when we think about our paralyzed patients, we really don't want them to remember being paralyzed. We don't want them only at a RAS of negative two. That's inappropriate. Consider a one-time dose of your lorazepam. If you're going to do prolonged paraly uh, paralytic therapy, you will need more than just a one-time bolus. But again, in this acute management phase, um, that's a consideration. I'll then talk just briefly about which paralytic to pick and when. Most people have brachyronium and vecuronium in their Pixis machines in their departments. They're easy to get. They're a single bolus. And again, looking back at your dosing and your duration of action for RSI, we know it can last 30 to 60 minutes, which might be just enough time to get them to be less asynchronous with the vent and have some better um, oxygenation. If you do need to move to a continuous infusion, and we should be using a train of four to monitor these patients. Um, and the drips typically do take some time to come from pharmacy as they need to be compounded and prepared. So again, don't delay. If you do think you need a paralytic, sedate your patient and opt for a bolus dose of a paralytic instead of going straight to an infusion. Again, that could take upwards of an hour to get that drip turned around and delivered to you. So think about that. Also, check in with your nursing staff and see how they are trained with train of four monitoring. Are they comfortable with it? Have they used it before? Is it something that's reasonable to expect them to have in their real house? Otherwise, you can always do PRN boluses every hour or so until they get up to the ICU and then can be put on the drips there. So I've talked about a lot of different things. Uh, most importantly, I want you to make a plan for your post-intubation sedation when you're making your RSI plan. Make that early. Make sure you're getting your team involved. So that way you have a seamless transition from that RSI period to the post-intubation sedation period. There's no outcome difference between using either dexmedetomidine or propofol. However, there is variability in the depth of sedation that you can achieve with these two medications. And it's important to realize that so you're picking the right medication for your patient. Consider early initiation of fluid resuscitation when it's appropriate, and also early vasopressor initiation in order to make sure that the patients can tolerate their sedative therapy. Make sure you're holding initial sedation in your patients post-ROSC and if they need a neurologic evaluation. And if you do have to use sedation, use low doses of things and medications that can be quickly turned off in order to get those assessments as those doses can linger a little bit longer in those patients. And then finally, never administer a paralytic to a patient 
for vent dyssynchrony without adequately sedating them. And that's all I have for you guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Martinelli. That was outstanding with a tremendous amount of pearls in terms of sedating patients post-intubation and providing them with appropriate analgesia. I'm going to remain off screen for a moment because Dr. Chan has been monitoring the Q&A and has just a few questions for you. Sure. All right. Um, great talk, Dr. Martinelli. So uh, some of the questions, it seems like one of the common themes is, um, do, you, do you have any thoughts about um, best sedation and, and shock, whether it be septic shock or other kinds of shock? Uh, you know, I think someone mentioned benzos and compared to you know, propofol or Prasidex. Um, so I will say that I would never recommend for a septic shock patient to initially start a midazolam or, or lorazepam infusion. Um, I think it's, if you need to do a bolus of, say, lorazepam because it is a little more pressure neutral, you want to do just a one-time bolus to bridge you until you get that more stable patient because you're starting your pressors early, you're starting your fluids early. Um, you know, I think it's, that's probably the route I would go. So again, focus on resuscitation. Consider starting those pressors before you even intubate, as we know intubation can cause a reduction in the patient's blood pressure as well. So again, plan that patient out as best as you can before you intubate and make sure that you're resuscitating. And then hopefully you have a little bit of room to start those um, sedative agents, even at low doses, um, and that may help bridge that a little bit. Uh, another, uh, I guess, common theme was use kind of alternatives as uh, monotherapy. So one, uh, someone asked whether uh, if there was any consideration for using opioids uh, for uh, sedation or ketamine as a monotherapy. Um, so opioids as, in their, as a standalone agent is probably not going to be adequate from a sedation perspective, and they may stack. Um, I think that's probably a rare thing, and we should be thinking about doing boluses followed by just maintenance infusions to just treat underlying pain, um, but not necessarily using opioids to get to sedative doses. In order to get them really sedated with opioids alone, you're going to have to use substantially higher doses, which then may accumulate and linger and make it harder to take off later. Um, so I would use caution with doing a straight just fentanyl drip as your sole sedation. As far as a ketamine infusion, you bring up a good point. There is some literature about using ketamine as a continuous infusion to manage these patients. Um, there are just a couple things to think about. So ketamine drips aren't readily available in a pre-packaged formulation that we can keep in the Pixis machine. It's a controlled substance. so. The documentation and the preparation required logistically, which I know it, it is not necessarily in everyone's wheelhouse, but on my end, I think about it, it's going to take me a lot of time to get that to the bedside. In the appropriate patient, we can always transition to a ketamine drip later, um, but I wouldn't say I want a ketamine drip up front unless this is a very planned intubation and you have an hour lead time before you need to actually get those meds on board. Um, ketamine also is typically a provider-only titrated medication. Um, versus your propofol, dexmedetomidine, um, that are typically nursing titrated, so it allows the nurses to micromanage at the bedside and get that patient to the right level of sedation. So some considerations and, and some things that just make ketamine harder to use um, and maybe not your best first-line agent. Great. Um, and I guess a couple other thoughts about, you know, in terms of whether or questions about you know, our management down in the ED and whether it affects kind of long-term care. One, one question is, uh, should we be worried about propofol infusion syndrome uh, in these patients that are started on propofol in the emergency department? And then also whether you've seen any uh, studies or data, I think, in the ED a lot of times, and granted, you know, it's difficult managing some of these patients that might be more agitated and it's easier for, um, you know, nurses to keep a patient at negative four, mm -hmm. uh, and that may be kind of where the nurses are, are, are pushing for. And uh, have you seen any in terms of data studies regarding kind of long-term, you know, adverse effects, increased morbidity uh, for patients with lower rascals initially? Sure. You know, compared to our goal of zero to negative two. Sure. I'm going to unpack that with the first part of uh, show you. What isn't of. I think in the first couple of hours, which ideally is the time period that they're spending in the ED, your incidence of developing propofol-related infusion syndrome is pretty rare. You would have to be using quite high, uh, very high doses of propofol. Um, and again, it's more common with high doses and prolonged periods of time. So 
Um, in our, as far as the ED management, we're, we're typically not hitting that mark um, because we ideally shouldn't be having these patients for a long period of time. And we should always be trying to keep them on the lightest level of sedation that we can. So while it's in the back of my mind and, and we do monitor for it, it's not a big enough deterrent to tell me not to use propofol in the ED. Um, as far as does our initial management dictate what happens in the ICU, clinical inertia exists, right? So if we start a patient and we get them down to a negative four, negative five, and we keep them there, when they get transferred upstairs, whether depending on that handoff process, it potentially is the clinical team's assumption that when we lighten sedation, bad things happen, right? If you send them up and they're very snowed and they were potentially difficult to control, there is clinical inertia to not drop them initially and potentially keep them on those higher doses, at least for that first 24 hours. So we do have you know, some responsibility to try to keep those doses lower so that we're not sending a patient upstairs with the expectation that they are always requiring these deep levels of sedation and these high doses of our sedative agents. Um, I do believe there was one paper that I, I'm not recalling all of the specifics, but did look at kind of what we do in the ED and then how it, it impacts down the line. Um, and I know that there was um, at least a negative connotation to what we're doing if we're deeply sedating patients, that they do end up staying deeply sedated upstairs. So what we do matters and making sure that we're, you know, yes, I agree. If you have a busy ED and you're very short staffed and you just don't have the manpower to have someone in the room 24 seven watching that patient, if you need to go a little bit deeper on your sedation, that's fine, right? You're deviating from the goal, but it is patient safety in order to make sure if that nurse does step out of the room, that tube is not pulled. You know, obviously we have to be reasonable, but we across the board shouldn't be keeping everyone at a level of negative four to negative five. So, great. And then uh, one last question uh, was that, you know, like we had talked about not trying to cloud our exams for our patients that are post ROSC. Um, what would you suggest to uh, using these patients, especially if uh, you're having some issues with vent compliance? Sure, I would um, try to stick with your propofol or dexmedetomidine, depending on whether or not the patient was bradycardic, I would avoid dexmedetomidine and probably stick with propofol. Um, and then if you're doing additional procedures, giving bolus doses of fentanyl to handle that procedure. So if you're about to put a central line and art line in, maybe consider giving a bolus of fentanyl. Again, that's gonna last for about an hour, so it gets you through that procedural time, and then you can keep kind of reassessing that patient. Um, but either propofol or dexmedetomidine could be used, again, at low doses. That way you can get that patient comfortable, but not have them so deeply sedated that when you turn it off, it's not going anywhere. So I'm thinking the like propofol doses of like 10 mics per kilo per minute um, would be an appropriate rate for them. All right, thanks Dr. Martin.